<laughs> I'll just turn this around so Eva can hear. Get a little bit closer so the volume is. So I really may have to move the camera. share a little bit out of 2 Timothy chapter 1 and and I'll maybe just unpack that a little bit and then close because I don't have much but what I do have I want to bring my two loaves or two fish and five loaves five loaves and two fish I can't remember what the order was how bad is that two fish five loaves Two fish and five loaves. So I'll bring my little bit, my little fish. So 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we'll start at verse 8. But I really want to get to verse 9. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling. So just touching on that. Let's not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of Paul, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. If you want the power of God, um, you're going to have to share in the gospel suffering. There's no power without suffering. Amen. Yeah? You can have a pseudo power, you can have a power, you can have an anointing from the enemy even. But do you want true power? You'll have to come to true suffering. That's where true joy is. True joy is in true suffering. So you've got problems with depression and anxiety and, and feeling low then your problem is you're not suffering for the gospel. You're not suffering for Christ. That's your problem. It's too much of self. Self is the problem. Self is in the way. You've given in to the selfish condition of your own life. Your own fallenness. So, Paul is saying to Timothy, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. This suffering is going to mean, we've spoken about this already today, but isolation and rejection. There are pastors now that were dear friends to me, even mentors who now reject me and won't return phone calls. I'm talking close leadership that have been great influences in my life that no longer return my phone calls. That I have to deal with that as a suffering and a suffering is, is a loneliness as well. There's a funny word for loneliness in Thai. It is ngao. <laughs> ngao. That means to be lonely. Kun ngao. Lonely person. That is part of the journey. If you're not lonely in this walk, you're not in this walk. Yeah? <laughs> I'm not saying that just because you're lonely 
you're saved and you're in Christ. But to be saved and in Christ requires you to bear something. You need to bear his name. My name itself, Christopher, means Christ bearer. One that bears the name. To bear that name requires a suffering, a loneliness, a rejection of men. In fact, a hatred. There are more Christians that hate me than, than people in the world. I've got more believers that used to be friends that hate me, that can't even speak to me, can't even bring themselves to speak to me than I do people in the world. Yeah. Yeah, a pastor who, who lied about me. So to work with us once and or something and blah 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 and, he's, and you're like no he asked to work <laughs> yeah so how did that that's not correct that's right so that's part of the call of God as a believer and that's the standard okay that's not the dizzy heights of being a you know an anointed saint of God that's the standard for all believers yeah Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Are you a prisoner of the Lord? Do you feel constrained? Are there constraints upon your life? Do you feel bound? See, the modern church today says, just be free, man. You need to have freedom. You need to come into freedom. You need to be free, brother. You need to be free, sister. Just get in and enjoy the freedom. Jump in the river. Just be free. (laughs) What about being constrained? Paul didn't describe himself as being a prisoner of the Romans. He was a prisoner of Christ. What are we? Do we describe ourselves in those words? Are you a prisoner for Christ? We don't wear that as a t-shirt, do we? (laughs) I'm free, brother. (laughs) I've got Jesus, you know, I'm happy. All the bumper stickers that associate wealth and luxury and blessing and fortune and... And I don't believe much of it is Christ at all. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. So it's according to the power. It's according to his issuing. What what issues from him his power provides the necessary grace to suffer. And it's a joy. To me, I, I sleep at night. Yeah. I have good rest. Regardless of what people say about me behind my back, there's a peace, there's a rest, there's, some, there's a grace there knowing that I'm in the will of God, knowing that to preach Christ and Him crucified. I shared on Tuesday night that on on Monday, the Lord came to me in a dream and He revealed that we are on this descent together. We are in the end of days and we're walking together down the hill into darkness that the days are getting darker that we're on the descent Mm -hmm. but he was he was taken by what he saw on like a a television 
up to our left of the gospel message of Christ and him crucified so much so that we're, as we're walking together I noticed that his gait slowed just to like half a step a little bit slower as he took time to observe the crucifixion his own crucifixion and his own resurrection it was all played out and it's, you know, it's like dreams and mysteries that visions the timing's perfect <laughs> but mysterious I don't understand it but his crucifixion his death, his burial, his resurrection was all there in about half a second but it was enough that it, it slowed his pace to observe and to look and it was enough without words being communicated to me it was like spirit to spirit I could hear what his spirit was saying to me Chris you need to continue looking at my my crucifixion my death, my burial, my resurrection Christ and him crucified that has to be the centre of everything that we, we speak about and that's the only thing that's going to centre us in these days yeah not the only thing, the only person amen, it's about Christ according to the power of God who has saved us I've highlighted this in my Bible the word saved I want you to notice that saved is a necessary and preceding condition of the calling he has saved us first before he's called us what are we saved from what are we saved out of that salvation is not a once once at the front of a church encounter it's an ongoing thing salvation takes time we need to be saved out of the world that takes time to come out of Egypt and we need Egypt taken out of us that's the bit that takes time saved us that precedes the calling and called us with a holy calling not according to our works so not according to your skills and this is a belief system that is prevalent oh well brother used to play drums so now that he's saved we'll employ him as a drummer in the worship team and we'll use his gift you know he's got to use his gift and his talent right like that stewarding his gift and his talent but the guy's still drinking still smoking still still dishonouring authority and his own parents and, but we've got to get him in we've got to get him working we've got to get him serving that's how the church system which is a Babylonian system puts their hooks in to you and keeps you under this religious construct that's not from Christ but you think you're doing that person a favour because you've put them through a three week course on deliverance or a um, cleansing streams eight week course and you've, you've found out through methods of surveying various others that they are sanguine and, and that they and that they're, called to, they're called to the arts ministry because that's all the check boxes that they've ticked leads them into that path um, of being involved in music ministry I'm saying this stuff because I was part of it. I used to sell this. <laughs> it's shameful. God forgive me. Have mercy. But he's called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Not enough emphasis. <laughs> 
is on the syllable here <laughs> of his own purpose. What is his own purpose? Why didn't I preach that when I was caught up with all this, this so-called pseudo psychology, Christian psychology of getting people into ministry when they're barely saved? They're brand new believers. They've never read the Bible. They don't even know the Lord. You, you know, you've had a feeling, you've had a sense. Yes, you've you've had a genuine salvation experience, but you, you don't really know the Lord. You've just yeah. walked in the door. Yeah. Your knowing of the Lord is something that comes, that's developed through testing and trial and encounter and His Word and repentance. <laughs> yeah. Isaiah was a prophet of God for the first five chapters of Isaiah used mightily of God. Chapter 6, he finally comes to know God. Woe is me. He discovers that he's a man. <laughs> discovers that he's a man of unclean lips. He's just been prophesying for the first five chapters. Amazing, incredible things. Use of God powerfully. But the journey takes you into a a deeper relationship with God, a face-to-face -face union with Him. And that's what we're all called to. Amen? That's what true intimacy is. It's face-to-face. -face. It's eye-to-eye, nose-to-nose, mouth-to-mouth, chest-to-chest. That's intimacy. That's what we're called to. And we can have it. called us with a holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began how wild is that anybody here remember when time began I don't even know where to put that. Like, where do you put that? How does the rational mind, the logical mind, deal with eternal constructs and ideas about time and eternity? But God's own purpose, Christ's own purpose for each of you, for me, was given sent of Christ before time began but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ so what Paul came to was a revelation of this mystery so the great mystery was already a reality people were being saved in the old covenant right we talked about that a while ago we all don't have a problem with that now Jesus had people saved in the Old Testament but was now revealed in the New the mystery was already at work but now appeared to all men this grace of God appeared now to all men so the lid was lifted when Christ came the lift was now lidded uh, the lid was lifted <laughs> try to say lidded the lidded was lifted Forgive me. I'm human. I'm mere humanity. <laughs> Rugged. Woe is me. But it's now been revealed by the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ. I love that, how Paul has identified Jesus as Saviour. One who saves. Only Christ can save us who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel so can we see something here in what he's saying it was already present but it's been brought to light immortality was already present in the old covenant 
death had been abolished in the old covenant but immortality life came to light through the gospel people were being resurrected from the dead people were coming to life from the dead isn't that amazing Elijah laying on people amazing people were being saved people were going into immortality in the old covenant Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him he walked from this life in the old covenant just like Elijah taken up didn't die didn't God's wrath is still the same as it was in the old covenant as it is in the new covenant so like we talked about at the school of ministry on anger and when we fly off the handle and get mad about stuff his wrath is perfect and it's holy it is just he just uses hailstones <laughs> yeah 100 pound hailstones mixed with blood and fire that's how he's going to bring the, the final end and we've got to, every island is going to be put away Men are going to be crying out for death, but they will not find it. That's what's coming. Men are going to be stung for five months because the smoke that's going to arise from the abyss is going to be filled with a plague of locusts that have stings like scorpions. They're going to sting men for five months and they will be in such agony. They'll be writhing in agony and they'll be seeking death. But death, it says, will evade them. They won't find it. They'll be looking to die and they won't be able to die. That's what's coming to the wicked. See, God is righting every wrong. And then the end will come. That's still not the end. That's the necessary leading up to the end. But we don't talk about that in church because that's offensive and that won't that'll bring the ties down by eighty five percent. But I don't even ask money. But money still goes into our account. We still have people tithing. <laughs> anyway, shall we read on? Isn't it amazing that you can get so much from one, one little passage in Timothy? <clears throat> Who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep me what I have committed to him until that day. Why is that day capitalized? What day is that? Is that the day? The day of the Lord? That's the gospel, guys. <laughs> it's always pointing to a day. See, we've made the gospel about your salvation and God's got a good wife for you and a plan for your life and he's going to heal you and give you a job and set you up. And, and yet Paul is talking about something else, a suffering. That's his gospel, teaching you that you must go through a, a necessary suffering for his sake that's part of your salvation calling he's pleading with Timothy this is his second letter to Timothy this is his second and, and some believe this is the, the last thing that he wrote before he died is that right? is that how you understand it? 
Yeah, that's how I understand the book of Timothy, or Second Timothy, was one of the last letters he ever wrote. So you're looking at a dying man's pleading. So you need to take these words seriously. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. Comes back to a person, comes back to Christ. Yeah? And am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. It's got a time limit. Everything in this life has got a day at the end of it. One day. We're all going. We're all pointed to that day. You can't avoid it. You can't turn your back on it. Let's go to Acts chapter 9 and I'll try and wrap it up. Acts 9, 15 to 16. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles. Do you remember who this was speaking? It's Christ. If you've got a Bible that has words in red, this is what the Lord Jesus is speaking to Paul. Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name. To bear it. Not carry it. Not walk alongside it. Not attend it on a Sunday. Or put it around your neck. Or on your bumper bar or t-shirt, website, Facebook posts, skin. You need to bear his name. What does that word imply or infer? <laughs> yeah. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? To bear his name. It means... I just see that as a cross. Who was the man that carried Jesus' cross for him? Simon. Simon of Cyrene. Stepped up and said, I'll help. And he bore the cross and he carried it up that, that hill of Golgotha. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. <laughs> That's salvation, guys. It's amazing. The road narrows. God is gracious at the beginning and gives us all sorts of scope to walk from one boundary to the next, bang into that idea and then come across and then bang into this idea. But as we walk through time, we bang our heads a little bit more frequently, don't we? On this thing and that thing. And, and eventually we come down to this very narrow path that we know that we can't walk over to the right or to the left. And if you look at Ezekiel, how the, the living creatures behaved, that they went straight. Yes. They didn't turn to the right or to the left. I want you to think about the throne of God right now, just for a second, and put yourself there. And think about the living creatures for a second. Those who were closest to God. Those were the only ones permitted in that radius of where God dwelt. They are bigger than cherubim. We think of cherubs, we think of Michael, we think of Gabriel, we think of you know, um, Lucifer, the covering angel. Compared to the living creatures, they are wimps. 
you're talking about those who are given to guard the throne of God those who are to carry the throne read Ezekiel chapter 1 again have a refresh yourself of who God is and the rank the authority that's on these living creatures and I want you to think about where the bowls of wrath come from if you read Revelation you'll discover that the bowl of wrath came from one of the living creatures those closest to God those closest to the throne wrath is close to God (laughs) that's who he is that's how he deals with with the wickedness and the corruption of anything that's not God and it comes from the highest authority outside of who God is those closest to the guardianship of the throne of God we're coming to some glorious days and so I want us to come to I guess a a place of of really taking to heart how serious this journey is that if you haven't given your life yet fully to Christ if you haven't really laid your life down in all areas let today be that day if you haven't laid down your career or your hopes or your dreams or your friends or your plans or other people's plans in your life I want you to be aware of what we're coming to like this is serious and we need to stand for God we can't play with sin we can't play with the world Titus 2.11 for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men this grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming the first time is an area that I think we all need to come up into and mature in understanding this is the thing that he said to me back in I think it was July end of July to understand his second coming we need to understand his first coming so what does his first appearing mean for me what does it really mean not just it's an nativity scene at Christmas that we celebrate once a year but this is so much more than anything outward this is an inward transformation that goes on before time that you are saved and you are called with a holy calling do you know what your holy calling is because you will be judged on that in the last day Jesus says in Matthew 7 that only those who do the will of my father in heaven will see eternal life so if I don't know what my holy calling is then how am I going to fulfill the will of God I need to know don't I what is my calling what am I called to do well at the most base level (laughs) it's fall on my face before him if I know that my life is walking parallel to him and his ways then I need to repent and get back on the path because the danger is if I'm playing with the world and I'm playing along the edges of this life there's a very high chance I'll slip in that I will be deceived if I haven't given my life to Christ in fullness if if I'm not looking for 
this heart that Paul has. Being a prisoner of Christ and sharing with Paul in the sufferings of the gospel or for the gospel's sake. <laughs> then I'm playing still with self in this world. That's got to be a cry. That's got to be something that's within me. And that's got to be something he reveals to you as well. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in his sufferings. For the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Awesome. Thank you, Lord. So another way to think about this, and I shared this a few weeks ago, was he can only accept from us what he has paid for. If it hasn't come from him, if he hasn't issued it, if he hasn't paid for it, it will be left unattended. It will be left unaccepted. That's the measuring stick. <laughs> Sorry to break that news to you. You can't do whatever you want in this life and then say in Jesus' name and sanctify it to yourself and to him. Or what seems right, even to our friends. But only, only that which is issued from him, only that which he has paid for will he accept. That's awesome. That's a great yardstick. Mm. So the other statement I would like to make is not trying to fulfill this by any means of our own. Any skills, any abilities, strong desires, you can't do it. That's beautiful. <laughs> We've got the pictures of Israel that only a remnant was saved according to the election of grace. The problem was that they were trying to fulfill the law by their own strength. And this is what we say in our own hearts, God, you owe me because I've done good today. I haven't sinned today like I sinned the day before, so you owe me something. Look, God, my works stack up. In Romans it says to him, your works, his wages are not considered a gift, but an obligation. Yeah. Does he trust in the Lord? Still, something else to do. God can't give to us if we can't say, I did it. Ephesians 2 8, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. So the gift of faith comes to us in this way that it bypasses any ability to do good. And it joins itself to Christ's own faith. Did we get that? Can I say that again? 
the gift of faith comes to us in this way that it bypasses our ability to do good works. And it joins itself to faith in Christ. When that happens, God now places that on your account as righteousness. That's awesome. Thank you, Lord. So faith will do something for us. Faith will cause us at times to speak the truth in love. God's looking for a generation today that will be like the Phineas's. Remember we spoke about that a few weeks ago? The one who would rise up with a javelin. (laughs) Phineas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my wrath away from the Israelites, for he was zealous for my sake among them, so that I did not consume the Israelites in my zeal. Declare, therefore, I am granting him my covenant of peace. You want the peace of God? (laughs) You need to get onto a javelin. (laughs) Yeah? You're going to have to fight for what is right. Not in your own strength, but in what is right in Christ. Standing up for what is right and true is effectively taking that javelin, writing that letter to that principle. Wow. Confronting a workmate, confronting a fellow believer, a friend, a sister, a brother. Count the cost before you do it because you need to have them on the altar like you should everybody. They should already be on the altar. Your friendships are an idol, that's the problem. You, you don't do this because you're still worshipping friendship. It's, not idol- it's idolatry. It's before God. We don't confront one another because we worship one another. Mm. So yeah? Yes. And we don't have peace because we're not willing to wage war. My wrath has been turned away from the Israelites because Phineas was zealous for my sake among them so that I did not consume the Israelites in my zeal. Declare, therefore, I am granting him my covenant of peace. Phineas kills two people and God grants him the covenant of peace. (laughs) Christ. He grants him Christ. The covenant of peace. That's wild. And in Psalm 106, I want us to remind us that this was picked up in Psalms. It's such an incredible act. I don't know if I've shared this before, but I think it's worth sharing again. Underline this in Scripture. So what I'm talking to you is out of Numbers 25. Who doesn't like reading Numbers because it's boring, it's about numbers and stuff. But see, the, what, the problem with not reading numbers is we don't know these things. We don't know God's covenant. We don't know him. We don't know his ways. It's just precious. We need to be in the word, the whole word. So Psalm 106 verse 31. But Phineas stood and intervened and the plague was restrained. It was credited to him as righteousness for endless generations to come. That act that Phineas did was credited to him as righteousness. That's awesome. That came through faith. That pleased God. It was issued by God. It was paid for by God. Therefore, it was acceptable by God. Nothing's changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And 
and we're going to see some things coming up in these days to come that might require even believers taking up arms and that will be credited as righteousness to them can we believe that? Do we have scope for that? Or are we, are we too polite now? Yeah. We better reconcile it because it's scriptural. Nothing changed in the new covenant. God hasn't changed. And there could be times for believers to make a stand for what is right. And it may even mean taking up arms. I'm not suggesting going out and buying guns and going around and killing people, but I'm just saying that we need to, you know, our scope is so narrow, isn't it? It's so polite, it's so deferring, it's so, you know, considerate of men that we've, we've written God out of the whole picture. We've written his righteousness out of the whole picture. We've written his ways out of the whole picture. Thank you, Jesus. Well, well, we'll leave it there. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, that you would help us in your word. Lord, help us acknowledge you, Lord, in every moment. Lord, it's not a Sunday thing that we acknowledge you. It's not around the communion cup and the wafer that we acknowledge you. It's not when we're feeling low that we acknowledge you. But Lord, it's a moment by moment, day by day. Lord, that we need to acknowledge you. We need to be thinking of you. We need to be considering your ways, your thoughts, your word, your purposes, your holy calling for us. Lord, for those here today, who don't know what their holy calling is in you, Lord, I pray that you would make it plain. <clears throat> Lord, how can we align with you if we don't know what we're aligning to? Lord, that we haven't spent the time sufficiently, we haven't even bowed down and asked, what am I to do? What is your purpose for my life? Lord, I pray today, Lord, that there be those here and those watching later, Lord, that would come to that place of what am I to do? What is your holy calling for my life? And Lord, that we'd come to that, Lord, with, with godly fear, godly reverence, godly obedience, godly faithfulness, Lord, that that would be, that be above every natural, earthly, worldly, human thing. Lord, help us prioritize, Lord, what the primary thing is. Lord, that we'd have the mind of Christ. We would be first and foremost thinking of what pleases you what glorifies you, what brings you glory Lord even today, Lord let today be one of those days that are marked in our hearts Lord a time stamp of a day that you came and you reminded us of these things of our salvation what it means and what what we're called to our holy calling Lord I bless you and I thank you Lord for each one keep them, protect them Lord as only you can Lord, I commit each one, Lord, into your hand. Into your ways, into your purposes, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
There's some thought that Hatch was, you know, like you're talking about the, um, you know, in a narrow way, you feel getting closer and closer. But the thing is, the Lord has put the boundaries low so that we ever want to step over and, and walk in flesh, it's not like constricting that we can't get out of it. If we want to follow the Spirit, and we will get you a narrow thing, but as soon as we want to walk in the flesh, whatever the situation is, God allows us just to jump over and walk off and run away. He doesn't hold us into those. We're not trapped in a, a narrow path. And yeah. constantly walking or staying in those boundaries that the Lord gives us. Well, I think so. Mm-hmm. You know, get to a point where we can say, no, no, this is too typical. I'll step over and go over that path. It's a bit easier. Yeah, well, the temptation is always yeah. for the easy, isn't it? Yeah. It's always the default to the world, the flesh, um, the enemy. You know, it's not even the enemy. The enemy gets blamed for a whole lot, but it's, it's often our own will. It's our own self-determination that leads us astray. Yeah, and the enemy uses that, obviously. Yeah. It's a statement of, of a hardened heart. Yeah. Paul says, love of God constrains him. He wants to constrain him. He absolutely wants to constrain him. Because he was the end of the presence of God. The fear of God, the love of God will constrain us. But as we know, of my own heart, if I know that I'm dwelling in the fear of God, the presence of God that will constrain us. We know. We're going to grieve the Lord. We absolutely know that. We should put fear of God. It always astounds me that in Hebrews 3 and 4, that Three times, Paul says the same thing. Three times the day you hear the words, do not harden your heart. Yeah. It's like very rarely when you see something mm. once is important, twice is incredibly important. Three times it's like, yeah. 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 three times repeating that same statement today, you hear the words, do not harden your heart. Because then anything's possible. You just yeah. treat God like, no, it's just a sin. So yeah, the grace of God. It's been revealed to all me and teaching us tonight to say no to ungodliness. There's so many rights to godly lives in this present world. We wait for his glorious, just the blessed hope of glorious appearing to us. And God saved Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all unrighteousness and purify us for himself and people that are very own eager to do what is good. Can't quite the recent Bible, it's just that and as a young believer that was so burned in my heart. It's a, such a beautiful, powerful gift. What the grace of God is and isn't. It's not yeah. a life. Yeah, eager to, yeah. you just said it, John, eager to do what is right. Yes. yes. Do our hearts yearn to eager to do what is right or to do what pleases self? That's, that's right. That's the that's test of what grace is or what grace we, exactly. we're holding to. Yes. True grace. True grace. <laughs> You'll be eager to do what is right. That was one of the arguments, I guess, that the teacher that we were talking to at the school said to us, but what about the grace of God? Remember the grace? And I said to him, Romans 7, grace is not a license to sin. (laughs) If you really understand the grace of God, you wouldn't even want to go near that. You don't want to touch, you don't want to go near it. You know, anything that's doubtful, you're not going anywhere near it. That's the grace. If you have a revelation of the cross and the blood that was poured out for that sin, that witchcraft and the grace that he has given us in that, by you know, wiping our sight clean, you would not even go near it. Yeah. And if judgment was not intervened, there was no intervention of the whole of Israel Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, what would have happened to Phineas in the world? You can't imagine that, that people around would have gone, good job, sunshine, you just killed two people, well done. Mm. He would have been taken. He would have been, he would have been, we don't know what happened to him, but we know that God said that what he did was righteous, but what did man say? We know that he came into the covenant of peace. There's not many in the word of God that have come into that. So... Whatever that looks like, man, I want to go and visit Phineas when I get there and go, wow, what does the covenant of peace look like? Because I want what you've got, you know. He came into the covenant of peace, no doubt, because around him, after what he did, was terrible storms. Mm. 
from what the world did would have done. Uh, you know, we killed, you know, two people. You would have had to come up before something. But those who are in Christ would have said, far out, thank you, Jesus, and, yeah. and blessed the God of heaven over that act. Yeah. Yeah. So he would have been praised and esteemed um, right. yeah, a, of what was in Christ. There was a line. There was yeah. a line drawn with that mm. act. So. And that's what we're called to. Yeah. We're called to that same life. That's all in Christ. That's all in grace. That's all love. <laughs> That's all mercy. That was. That was the kindness of God to preserve a nation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Amen. Well, bless you. Good to see you, Eva.